Hello, we're glad you've joined us for this live webinar, Unraveling the Legacy and Future of Hepatitis B Diagnosis, Clinical Impact of Conventional Molecular Tests and HPV RNA to Monitor Hepatic Infections. I am Michelle Ashton of Labbers, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labbers, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration. It's presented by Abbott Molecular. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit www.abbott.com. Let's get started. You can post questions to the speaker during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them into the drop-down box located on the far left of your screen labeled Ask a Question and click on the Send button. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the arrows at the top right-hand corner of the presentation window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by typing it into the Ask a Question box on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Gavin Cloherty of Abbott Diagnostics. To learn more about our speaker, please visit the speaker tab at the top right of the presentation window. Dr. Cloherty will now begin his presentation. Thank you, and uh, thanks for joining me. Start with the disclosure slide. I'll just leave that up for people to, to see. We actually have a second disclosure slide that uh, relates to the assay that we will mention a little bit more about during this presentation, the uh, HPV RNA assay, and it's a research use assay at this point, and it's not for diagnostic use. So. As most of you will know, uh, hepatitis B is a significant uh, health problem globally. Uh, with an estimated 2 billion people have been exposed to hepatitis B, and about 300 million people are chronically infected worldwide. As you can see from this slide, there's an uneven distribution of prevalence um, of hepatitis B with the higher prevalence in Asia and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa relative to uh, North and South America and Europe. So there's been a lot of um, excitement around the area of uh, hepatitis, viral hepatitis, and particularly around hepatitis C, that's now uh, considered a, a curable uh, virus, a curable disease, uh, due to the development of direct acting antivirals. So uh, now a person who has hepatitis C could be cured in as little as eight weeks um, with one pill once a day. So it's, it's quite a, a fantastic um, development. And why that is possible for hep C, you can see in this slide, is that the virus does not uh, have a, a good reservoir in the host. It's basically present in the cytoplasm, and it doesn't integrate into the host DNA. As you can see, HIV is very different than that. It has a, an integrase gene. It becomes basically part of the person that it infects, and this proviral DNA can produce uh, replicating virus. Um, so you've got that lingering reservoir there that's very difficult to eradicate. Hepatitis C does not have that, so treatment for 8 to 12 weeks is sufficient to uh, stop replication and allow the hepatocytes to turn over and the patient to be cured. Hepatitis B, again, in contrast, is not like hepatitis C or HIV, probably a little more similar to HIV than hep, uh, hep C, as it does have a reservoir in the patient hepatocyte in the form of a covalently closed circular DNA molecule, a little pseudochromosome that is, remains in the nucleus um, and is uh, difficult to eradicate. This slide uh, illustrates the standard um, HPV life cycle and the standard of care today, which is uh, nucleoside analogs. And you can see that the, the virus enters the cell, it's unwrapped, makes its way to the nucleus where it's present either as a relaxed circular DNA molecule or a covalently closed circular DNA molecule, you know, acting as that reservoir of the virus in the, in the hepatocyte. And from there, it, it makes its RNA intermediaries and then 
proteins, et cetera, et cetera, in the life cycle, and eventually an a, uh, encapsulated virus leaves the cell. Um, and what's interesting in this slide is you'll see the two X's there, and that indicates the part of the viral life cycle that's interrupted by the administration of nucleoside analogs. So basically, the, the uh, conversion of the viral RNA into DNA is stopped, but nothing else is really impacted by nucleoside analog therapy. Um, everything that happens upstream uh, from the RNAs to the CCC DNA uh, is not impacted by this treatment. And an alternative therapy, which is also available but has a very unfavorable side effect profile, is pegylated interferon, and that's not used um, a lot in developed countries um, or around the world. Um, although the treatment is finite, um, it does have a lot of side effects. So extended nucleoside analog treatment is the preferred route, and that can be years, decades, or even lifetime of therapy. So stimulated by the great success in the development of new drugs for hepatitis C, there's a significant amount of interest and effort being placed into developing new curative and better therapies for hepatitis B. And this is a very busy slide, but it illustrates a lot of the efforts um, and the, the targets for these new therapies, whether they be immune modulators, entry inhibitors, uh, capsid modulators, um, and in trying to find different ways to treat hepatitis B by attacking different parts of the virus life cycle. Also illustrates many of the pharmaceutical companies that are um, actively involved in this effort. The holy grail uh, for these new treatments would be to either eradicate, eliminate the reservoir of hepatitis B from the hepatocytes, the covalently closed circular DNA, or to render it transcriptionally silent, to turn it off. So effectively turning the engine off. And in order to understand the impact that these drugs are having on uh, the virus in the nucleus, it's important to have surrogate markers that are available in the plasma of the patients receiving the drugs that would give us an, a window into what's happening and an indication on the effect of these drugs. And some um, potential biomarkers that are illustrated here um, are the pregenomic RNA, which is the first thing that the covalent closed circular DNA makes, so it's a very good target. Um, also, hepatitis B E antigen and S antigen. Those are areas that are uh, routinely looked at for new drug development. This graph that was uh, recently published in um, Butler et al. Um, in hepatology uh, illustrates the dynamic of, of the viral kinetics of hepatitis B. Uh, traditionally, you see the DNA at a relatively high level, but drops precipitously once nucleoside analog treatment is started. In contrast to that, hepatitis B RNA, as we showed in the previous slide or discussed in the previous slide, is not impacted by this therapy, so it remains relatively stable even as the DNA levels drop. And then over time, as the CCC DNA becomes less active or less transcriptionally active, it's, uh, the levels of RNA detectable in the plasma decreases. To that end, and to facilitate this research, um, Abbott has developed a HPV uh, RNA assay that's highly automated on the M2000 platform. Um, we designed the assay to be high throughput and to be reproducible and precise, uh, to have an excellent sensitivity with a limit of detection at about 44 units per mil. And we tried to calibrate our HPV RNA units uh, to the WHO DNA standard to have some frame of reference. Um, we also wanted to compare this test to the existing manual method that was used to study HPV RNA. It's uh, published in Van Bommel et al. And it's a race method that's a rapid amplification of cDNA ends. And that has a limit of detection of about 300 copies per mil. And it's, again, manual method, quite labor intensive. In the design of this assay, we also placed uh, two targets, one in X and one in core. And the rationale for having two targets in our assay was twofold. One, uh, for redundancy in case of a mutation that might impact the performance of one of these targets. And secondly, to try and understand if the virus was producing only entire pregenomic RNA 
or if there were other uh, species of RNA that may be present in the plasma. So looking for the one uh, or the combination of all. And this slide shows a, a small study we did looking at the relative performance of the added RNA assay compared to the race method. Um, and you can see where in, in the right-hand side, where both assays were uh, detectable and quantifiable, the correlation was quite good. It was excellent. Um, at the low end, there was a little bit of a, a deviation, but I think that probably relates more to the manual method, some of the imprecision around the manual method versus an automated method. And then on the left-hand side, you can see that the ADAPT method is uh, considerably more sensitive as expected than the race method, and many of the samples that were undetectable by this method were still detectable and are quantifiable by the Abbott RNA assay. We wanted to look at the correlation of this pregenomic RNA assay um, in patients who are chronically treated and on therapy versus those who were not treated and to see what the dynamic would be and how the DNA and RNA values uh, would relate to each other. As you can see here in, in uh, panel A, in a chronically uh, infected Hep B patient who's on treatment, as expected, the DNA levels have, are lower and the RNA levels are less uh, impacted. So you see that the RNA levels can be higher uh, than the DNA levels. Um, contrast to that, if you look on, in panel B, in donor uh, samples that are Hep B positive, so one would assume that they're not on treatment, um, the values of DNA are on average about one and a half logs higher than uh, the, the RNA values. So this is uh, as expected and a nice validation. So we took it a step further. We wanted to understand, is the RNA produced um, from the very start in an infection, in, in the acute phase, and is it consistent uh, to try and understand if this is uh, effectively the RNA being released uh, accidentally or is there an actual mechanism uh, which the RNA may be released into the plasma. So we studied plasmapheresis donors with acute hepatitis B infection. We had three of them at our disposal. Two of them had resolved the infection spontaneously and one had gone chronic. And you can see from the right-hand side, the graphs on the right-hand side, uh, two things. One is that the uh, RNA is present very early on, pretty much from the get-go and that it is very consistent to the DNA, present at very consistent levels. And that as these uh, infections resolve, obviously both markers disappear and the RNA disappears first. Um, and in the chronic infection, they track very nicely uh, with the DNA and they remain at about one and a half to 1.7 logs lower than the DNA value. Also, we're seeing a trend that the uh, X and core uh, markers of this assay, so looking at the entire pregenomic RNA and then the pregenomic RNA plus any other RNAs that may be present, there's very little, there's really no difference between the two. So uh, we're not really seeing any evidence of any other RNA um, molecules in the plasma other than the entire pregenomic RNA. So this was um, some interesting uh, new findings uh, based on this research and kind of allowed us to redraw this schematic um, which then showed that the RNA is present uh, from the acute phase at a very consistent level to the DNA. And then as expected, the DNA drops when nucleoside analog treatment is initiated and that the RNA remains constant and then over time will decrease um, when somebody is on treatment. We did some additional studies looking at uh, the correlation between the X and the core um, targets in our assay in chronic patients. Um, and you can see here on the left-hand side in panel A that the correlation, again, is excellent. And on the right-hand side, that uh, in a bland Altman, that there, again, the correlation is very good and that the discordance are mostly in, at the low end of the dynamic range, but also that there's a slight bias in favor of the core, about 0.2 log units per mil, and that's um, based on the performance of the PCR reactions and not really anything biological. We've actually been doing quite a bit of uh, research with various um, institutions and collaborators to try and understand the potential clinical utility of the RNA assay. And this uh, study was recently presented in Vienna at the International Liver Conference 
um, and its collaboration with King's College, we looked at the performance or the, the um, value of pregenomic RNA on patients who are on nucleoside analog treatment. In this case, we're talking about tenofovir, um, and whether or not they lose E antigen. And e antigen positivity and loss is considered a favorable clinical outcome. So in this study, there were 28 E antigen positive patients who received tenofovir. And after a median follow-up of 64 months, uh, 26 of them, or 93%, had become DNA negative. Uh, 17, or 61%, had achieved E antigen loss, and one patient actually achieved S antigen loss, which would be considered a functional cure. There was no significant differences at baseline, uh, but there were differences uh, that became apparent after about six months of treatment where the patients who lost E had a significant drop in their HPV RNA relative to those who did not lose E. Um, as you can see in this slide about those who did not lose E had a median uh, HPV RNA of 5.87 log versus 3.48 from those who, who had lost E. Um, you can see this down in, in panel C here in this, in this graphic. Um, also, a drop of one log units per mil of um, HPV RNA at six months had a very good positive predictive value of 71.4%. So that was a very uh, interesting finding. Again, this is a relatively small M, but this is a powerful pointer as to a potential clinical utility for this test. And then those who achieved um, S loss had a significantly lower um, RNA level at the end of treatments. And at the last follow-up, you can see down here um, in panel C, the RNA levels are markedly different between those who lost E and those didn't, who did not. So this would imply that pregenomic RNA is a selective marker for interrupted transcription of CCC DNA, whereas DNA um, reflects the interruption of DNA replication by the nucleoside analogs. <clears throat> Additional research that again was uh, conducted with King's College and again presented at the International Liver Conference um, earlier this year looked at the ability to predict patients who may have an ALT flare following the withdrawal of nucleoside analog treatment. So in this study, 25 patients who had been suppressed for uh, three years uh, were taken off treatment and then followed for 52 weeks. And we looked at the uh, ALT levels in these patients, and that's an indication of liver inflammation. And severe flares or severe inflammation of the liver can require somebody to be uh, put back on treatment, and it's actually quite uh, dangerous. So it's important, uh, it will be useful to be able to stratify patients uh, and those who are at risk of these severe flares, maybe not a good candidate, candidate to withdraw therapy. You can see in the bottom of this uh, slide the various kinetics. So on the left-hand side here, you can see the DNA drops very rapidly in the first year uh, for the vast majority of patients becomes undetectable within the first year. And with a small minority, about three patients, it takes about two years uh, to go undetectable uh, for their DNA. And then on the right-hand side, you can see that that picture is very different when we look at the RNA. Many patients become undetectable after a year, but several uh, become uh, it takes three years or more to become undetectable, and actually a few of them do not lose uh, RNA at all. So if we look at this uh, trial and look at the, um, first of all, what, what constitutes a flare and uh, stratifying it by minimal to no flares, which would be less than two of the upper limit of normal VLT, about nine patients fell into that category. Mild would be between two and five of the upper limit of normal, and 11 uh, patients fell into that category, or about 44% of this uh, study. And then severe flares that were categorized as greater than 10 upper limit of normal, there's about five patients and 20% of the study participants who fell into this uh, category. And looking at this slide, we're, we're taking a look at the baseline characteristics, and you do see some differences between the three different groups that the baseline DNA was lower among those who did not have a flare versus those who had a severe flare. Um, also, the correlated antigen assay uh, gave results that were lower among those who had no flare versus a flare. And then uh, the RNA, obviously, also was uh, significantly lower in those who did not have a flare versus those who did. It seems to 
um, increase between the mid and the severe, so the, these levels of markers. Now, that, these are, this is very interesting data to stratify patients based on risk at the, at the baseline, but really in order to effectively know when to treat somebody, you've got to look at the markers um, on treatment or at the time when you're considering taking them off treatment to see if there's any um, indication as to the safety of doing that. And here we look at the uh, DNA between those who had no flare, mild flare, and severe flare, and as you can see, it's remarkably unremarkable. There's no difference between the three populations. In contrast, or actually similar to that, if we look at the surface antigen, uh, there's really no significant um, difference between the three, and you can't uh, tell that them apart or stratify patients who might be good predictors or good candidates to stop treatment. In contrast to that, if we look at the RNA, four of the five uh, patients who had a severe flare still had detectable and quantifiable um, RNA at the time uh, when treatment was stopped. So I think this is, uh, indicates that it might be a good predictor for those patients who are candidates to stay on treatment and, and not good candidates to, to withdraw the nucleoside analog. In, in rare cases, actually about 1% to 2% of patients uh, with chronic Hep B per year will lose surface antigen. <clears throat> and this is, <clears throat> excuse me, um, obviously infrequent, but it's considered the most favorable outcome. It's uh, basically a functional cure. So loss of S antigen, undetectable DNA, and abscess, absence of ongoing liver damage. And in this uh, study, looking at 19 patients who were on long-term nucleoside analog treatment, all of them were non-cirrhotic. Uh, who achieved S loss and uh, where nucleoside analog treatment was withdrawn, uh, two patients after a period of weeks uh, had a relapse. So the DNA became positive and they basically um, would be considered to go back on treatment. And here we look at the HPV DNA, the pregenomic RNA, the S antigen, and anti HBS uh, to see if there were any predictors um, at the end of treatment to see who or when treatment was withdrawal to see who might be good candidates for this withdrawal and who potentially should be kept on treatment. It's very interesting how this broke apart because for DNA, again, there's no real difference between those two who relapsed versus the population, the 17, who did not. Surface antigen really didn't give us much of a, an indication either. But again, the pregenomic RNA in the relapsers was still positive and quantifiable at the time when the treatment was withdrawn. And also, the antibody to surface antigen uh, in those who did not relapse was higher than in those who did, which would imply that the, they had a more robust immune response that was keeping the virus in check when the treatment, the, direct, the antiviral treatment was withdrawn. So again, this is uh, showing the same um, data, but just with the table on the side here that shows that um, the median RNA value was zero. Um, in those who did not relapse versus two logs roughly in the two uh, patients who, who did, uh, again, relapse. So this, could, um, this would indicate that the RNA assay is a good predictor of those uh, patients who lose S who might be at risk of relapse uh, following the withdrawal of nucleoside analog therapy. So changing direction slightly here with these uh, slides, these subsequent slides here, uh, we're looking at a different um, therapy. So this is not really standard of care. This is looking at some experimental new therapies. Uh, one interesting um, compound is a silencing RNA, and there are several of them uh, in development and in trials, and we'll focus primarily on some data that was generated with this test uh, using our, with the um, arrowhead compound. Um, so again, looking at the life cycle, um, obviously the first thing that the covalent and closed circular DNA makes is RNA. And this, uh, these silencing RNAs then target these um, pregenomic RNA and uh, render them uh, useless and, and impact the viral life cycle very early on. And this data is from the ARC520 trial, and this uh, compound is no longer in development. There's a revised and improved version uh, silencing RNA that's in, in clinical trials right now. And these, uh, this was put on a backbone of entecavir, a nucleoside analog treatment, and at the start, an initial dose of ARC520 was given, and you'll see a precipitous drop in both 
um, DNA and RNA following the administration of this silencing uh, RNA. Uh, here we're looking at three E antigen positive subjects. And you can see after a period of time, the RNA um, starts to rebound. Uh, again, the DNA does not. It continues to go down, and that is because these patients are con continue on that backbone of entecavir, nucleoside analog therapy, that interrupts that uh, replication process. So, uh, but later, after a period of weeks, uh, there were some other additional doses of the silencing RNA that were administered, and again, you can see an additional drop in the DNA and uh, reflected also in a drop in the RNA in these patients. What was interesting in, among these three patients is that um, some of them lost E antigen, and that was predicted by the drops in RNA, as you can see in the second patient down, and also in the third patient where the RNA dropped, came back a little bit, and then dropped again. And these two patients um, lost E antigen, which is, again, a, a very favorable clinical outcome um, in these three patients. Again, this uh, is a novel uh, compound not in, not in development, but a good strategy uh, for potential curative therapies. In conclusion, the measurement of hepatitis B pregenomic RNA during the natural history of Hep B uh, and on treatment with current or new agents could characterize residual hepatitis B RNA and give us some indication as to the transcriptional activity of the covalently closed circular DNA decline of hepatitis B RNA um, may present an important goal for novel therapies, uh, with hepatitis B pregenomic RNA decline potentially being associated with favorable treatment endpoints. As we showed in these previous slides, uh, the measurement of Hep B RNA is a helpful marker to predict sustained loss of S antigen without HBV DNA reactivation following the withdrawal of nucleoside analog therapy. It was also uh, useful in predicting patients who may be at risk for severe uh, ALT flares following the withdrawal of therapy, and also those who may uh, benefit uh, from silencing RNAs and may lose S or lose E antigen uh, following these, these novel therapies and actually um, following nucleoside analog treatment as well. Additional large-scale trials are ongoing that will hopefully help elucidate uh, the clinical utility of this test further and we look forward to reporting those results to you at a future date. With that, I'll uh, bring the presentation to a close and uh, open up for questions. Thank you, Gavin, for your presentation. A quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Simply type them into the drop-down box located on the far left of your presentation window labeled Ask a Question and click on the Send button. Gavin will answer as many questions as time permits. Our first question is, viral load and HBSAG classification have real correlation? Okay, so <clears throat> I guess if we're, if we're talking about uh, viral load from a HBV DNA quantification versus surface antigen, the correlation is loose uh, at best. It's not really a, a great correlation. Um, the, if we're talking about RNA, it's the same. Uh, correlation is not always um, as good as one might might hope. Uh, there is some correlation, of course, but not really uh, great. Uh, there's a lot of debate about the potential sources of surface antigen and whether or not some of the um, detected surface antigen is coming from integrated DNA um, in, into the uh, host genome. So that uh, might explain why some of the correlation is not as good as it uh, otherwise should be, or could be. Great, thank you. All right, your next question is, is elevated intracellular pgRNA an HPV-related hepatocellular carcinoma tumor biopsies linked to patient prognosis? So I think these, that's a good question. I think we're uh, the field is um, looking at many biomarkers that may help uh, in, the, in the prognosis of people with, with HCC. I know that we're involved in studies that are looking at um, HBD RNA in plasma uh, and also correlating them to biopsy samples, so hopefully we can get some uh, additional information uh, soon. There are other HBV uh, molecular uh, markers that may be better or 
maybe other predictors of uh, those who are at higher risk of uh, progressing to HCC, um, such as spliced variants. So there's uh, the, the virus uh, can sometimes splice, and the relative percentage of this splicing going on uh, may be indicative of those who are at risk of uh, progressing. So lots of activity in that area too. Thank you. Has your team come across any samples that had undetectable serum, HPV RNA, with an elevated DNA load prior to beginning NA treatment? Um, that's an easy, that's a short answer would be no. Uh, we've not found any um, individuals who had uh, high HPV DNA with negative RNA. Uh, we really do find that trend of about one and a half to two log difference um, it holds true regardless of when we look, um, as long as they're not on, on therapy. I would like to once again thank Gavin for his presentation. I'd also like to thank the audience for joining us today. Questions we did not have time for today will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. We would like to thank our sponsor, Abbott Molecular, for today's educational webcast. Labrids will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.